there's no restriction in in, in uh, exercise selection as long as it, again as it's pain free. Okay. So I would assess them. Can they touch their toes without pain and so on? So mm-hmm. if they can, t- if they have the movement with no pain mm-hmm. of touching their toes coming back up, then I would say, okay, let's do a back extension. But your tempo will be uh, zero zero. Uh, so you have a pause of. 45 seconds or 30 seconds or 20 seconds, however long they can handle. Mm-hmm. And isometrical? And isometrical. I would start with 45 degree angle and then, then start doing the movement and whatever they can with that movement and then you go up. And then funny enough, some people cannot do uh, a back extension too well, but they'll be able to do a deadlift. I would think a so. Light, a light deadlift. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what it is. So I would imagine some of these guys with spinal stenosis would have problems if they let go of the extension too fast coming down. In if they had a partial, even a partial range extension, leaning over right at the waist yeah. and coming up, yeah. the, they would have problems with the eccentric control of that. Yeah, and, e- and even you know what I mean. Yeah, but I had a I had a client. He had an operation. He didn't have a spinal solstitious. He had an operation in his back, and uh, he was giving. That's the one thing, also. Eh? As a strength coach or a personal trainer, if you have someone with a spinal solstitious, you should always be in contact with a doctor. Mm-hmm. I think right. to know what's going on. Right. Okay. And because they, and again, hopefully the doctor is a good doctor, and they'll be able to help you out. Um, but again, as long as you're pain free uh, during and after. What I mean by pain-free, it's very important to mention this, is that if you have a little bit of pain or discomfort, I should say during, but after they're done, they feel great. The day, the, after the workout, the day after and two days after, then it's good. You're doing a good job. Right. If they feel okay, but then they have pain that afternoon and the next day, then there's something wrong. Perfect. You cannot do this anymore. You're stressing the, the area or the body too much. The body cannot, the stress that you're giving it is too much. And coaches need to learn that because they're not medical professionals. They could be good at coaching. But if there's a, a spinal disease is a medical condition. So if you don't have an understanding as a coach of a medical condition, yeah. you have to go on something. And the something is what you just said was perfect advice for a coach, right? Yeah. Pain for me is number one. Pain and range of motion is number one thing. Like uh, I always, always ask people, are you okay? Is it painful? And then he says, well, some people don't know the, between the difference between pain and soreness. As is it a joint pain, like you feel like you're going to hurt yourself, or is it you're just, like it's burning? And if they say it's burning, well, that's good then. If it's burning, just keep going. That's a, a muscle that is a course and a seminar by itself is how yeah. to talk to your client and interpret the subjective feelings of pain yeah. versus soreness. Mm. Right? Yeah, exactly. And usually soreness will... Uh, They'll figure it out after. So what I would do sometimes, I would have them do, uh, uh, if they, uh, let's say they have, uh, uh, for example, I had someone that had knee pain. So I, didn't, I made him do fifth, as many back extensions as I could. <laughs> so what do you feel in your back now? It's, it's burning. So okay, is this the pain you have in your leg? When you tell me you have pain in your leg or is it a different Perfect. pain? Perfect. It's, dif- <laughs> it's different. I said, okay, now that's pain. What you had now on your back after 50 some back extension, that's Muscle that's lactic acid burns. So that's a different. That's a muscle pain. Yeah, which is good, but you don't want to have a joint pain. And they they learn the difference with that because it's very important. That they, because some people they have no clue. They think that uh, muscle soreness is. I've had people coming out with. Hey, Andre, I think I have a tumor. <laughs> because they lost so much weight, they could see the they could see the clavicle <laughs> for the first time, <laughs> and they think it's a tumor. <laughs> yeah. So, but the people don't know. They just don't know. But anyway, so with this spondylolisthesis, I think it's very important that you go very. There's nothing wrong going gradually. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the Yankee workshop, Norm Abraham, no yep. Norm. Mm-hmm. Measure twice, cut once. Right. Or well, same thing with body. You know, ask many times, and then you can go move on. If you don't have a proper answer, don't <laughs> don't cut the lumber yet. You know, it's not ready. So, so just ask the questions. Are you are you okay? Right. Is it info? You, can you move, and then you, you then you move on with that. So, so are you saying that with spinal stenosis, uh, the programming would be similar for just about anybody where you want to strengthen extension extensors, but it, it would be maybe a little slower if they have pain, or you have to just ask them more precautionary questions before you do things, more testing for this thing. For me, what I do is I always look at their range of motion. The number one thing I want to achieve is as much range of motion as possible, pain-free. Mobility. Mobility. Then you load. Got it. 
Ah, so a okay. back extension is just the body. Like they always start with just the body. And even even before that, what I'll do sometimes with some people that tell me they don't have a spinal stenosis, they say I have back pain. They say I can't do deadlift. I cannot do a Romanian deadlift or whatever it is because my back is hurting. So what I will do is I will put them on a seated leg curl and I ask him to do a row. Mm -hmm. And I say, how are your arms? Are your arms okay? And I always put attention on their arms. And then if someone tells me, yeah, my arms are good, but my back, I can feel my back, oh, that's one red flag. Right. It's a low load. It's the same position as a Romanian deadlift somewhat mm -hmm. at 90 degree. You know, mm -hmm. Because the pull, the pull, you know, is, is forward, so you're back, so you're stabilizing your back. If they have no pain in that situation, I will have them do a seated row with a heavier load, heavier load, heavier load. So it's a static because if you roll, you have to, all your rectus spines are contracting and even your glutes mm -hmm. because you have to stabilize your back. Sure. So it's a low impact, uh, low stress for the back. That's how I start the training. Well, it's you interesting. Have to have perfect it's, position. Yeah, it's interesting too because in that position, sit, seated, I don't know if you if you thought about this, but the, Bro, the well, the spine is weight bearing. If you lay prone, you're oh. not weight bearing. So actually, yeah. the, your your spine is sitting on the facets. It's, mm -hmm. it's bearing weight from top down. There's a load already based on gravitational force and your position of yeah. sitting. There's a load. Yeah. It actually starts to activate your postural muscles more. Yeah. Than if you're laying on your stomach ready to do a curl, a hamstring curl or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so it's so it's, it's, it's a different action. Thing to do or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no I think, well, it's certainly more functional. It's good to have the spine loaded because, you know, you do, you, you know, a farmer and people upright all day, are, are their yeah. spines are always loaded. Yeah, yeah, You know, in, in effect, compressed. Yeah. So sometimes I would do the seated row not to train their upper back, just to train the posture so they can, hand, they can handle a, a deadlift eventually. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the thing I want to mention also is that for me, and I mentioned this to you earlier, but it's, the one lift that I must do to keep my back healthy is a, is a barbell and back squat or a front squat. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't have to be loaded. Right now, I'm 51, proud to be. Mm -hmm. But if I, if, I, if, I do, if I cannot do my squats for a long time, my back pain, my back discomfort, I should say first, will come back. And if I don't do nothing, then it becomes more of a, a pain. Like I'll get up in the morning, ugh, geez, it's... Because it's still there. I will always have my two transverse process will never go back. It's always separate. Yeah, you always have basically a fracture. It's chronic. It's been there a long yeah. time. You have scar <laughs> tissue, but they're separate. The bones are separated. There's a yeah, exactly. an unhealed fracture in there. And yeah. so that's good for coaches to know that yeah. um, you can bring someone back relatively quickly by putting them in a non-painful spinal position and start activating the spinal yeah. extensors and, and other muscles. Yeah, and also as a safety thing also, I would not load the back on a squat. I would do a squat with dumbbells or just, first of all, it should be, That's if you're going to start doing squats, so you did the other exercise, so you, you, they have range, uh, full range of motion, mm -hmm. body weight only, with proper technique. Then when you start loading the squat, it should be with dumbbells. I would not load the, the back right away because, again, you're compressing the spine even more. Perfect. So you start, I would start with dumbbells first, mm -hmm. much safer. And they can go as deep. And uh, the important thing is, I think, for me, with someone like that, is to have the range of motion, pain-free with some load. You don't have to have, uh, you know, you're not going to be training Olympians. Right. Well, people are going to be competing, you know. Well, the final, the final subject I want to cover today is with the maintaining the range of motion or gaining range or maintaining range. Like right now, for you, it's about maintaining range, not so much about uh, lifting heavy loads on mm -hmm. your spine. Uh, which has kept you pain free. So yeah. I'd like to talk about how you're using fascial stretch therapy. Your wife is doing this on you to yeah. make sure you maintain range. Could you just uh, briefly talk about what is she doing for you that actually helps your spine? Uh, definitely, when Susan works on me, what it does, it, it just releases my hip. That's the biggest uh, change I, I see and I feel is that it releases all my hip, mm -hmm. and because my hip is more flexible. Mm -hmm. Then I, I feel loose, like I feel like I can at my range, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. uh, my squats are, again, I go back to the squats, but my squats are immediately better. Mm -hmm. My spine is immediately stronger. Mm -hmm. The best way I can uh, 
I can explain it. I, I have uh, some student uh, that has spondylolisthesis. He might have more than stage one. I don't really don't know his stage, yeah. but uh, he could not stretch like you. Like you're amazing with your spondylolisthesis. The fact that you can actually tolerate a lot of the stretches, especially like yeah. hip flexor stretch, because it extends your yeah. spine. So yeah. for him, uh, and this is a tip for you coaches with people who have this problem. The bottom leg, if you're going to do a hip flexor stretch on the side, assisted stretch, bend the bottom knee way up to their chest. In fact, yeah. have them hug their knee to their chest and also drop the chin to the chest. So it's almost a fetal position on one side. Then the top leg, which you bring behind the body into hip extension, can tolerate hip extension stretch for the hip flexors without irritating the spinal anesthesis. And yeah, again, it's yeah. got to be pain-free, right? So this guy yeah. said... There's absolutely no pain, and it's the first time in my life that I actually felt my hip flexor stretch. Because mm. with spondylolisthesis, they can't, they don't like, traditionally, they don't like hip, any hip extension. One side, both sides, they don't like the back to extend. Mm. It, it increases the spondylo. Yeah. yeah, and it's totally true because I've learned, I think, because it's funny you mentioned it because when Susan stretches me that way, I do naturally bring my ah, chin in. Okay. Uh, but I think that's instinctive again. Yeah. And uh, the one thing also is that for sure, if you have, if I, if anything happens where my back hyperextends, for sure I'll feel it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember on uh, on the lying leg curl, a long time ago. If I would do it, if I would be careful, I would feel my back. Sure. Because my yeah, because my back would arch like crazy. Yeah. And then I le I learned to contract my abs, <clears throat> neutralize, get keep the neutral. Line on my spine, and then I never had any problem. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, and I never had any problem with that. And when I learned, I realized, too, okay, I have to stabilize my spine. If I stabilize my spine, I'm laughing. Well, but the good, stabilize my spine, the squat, the deadlift are yep. the best exercises. Exactly. Well, the 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 prone leg curl is very unforgiving for those who lose form. You see oh, yeah. it in the gym all the time. They're always going to anterior pelvic tilt. So that's a classic example of lower loads, perfect form before you progress your loads yeah. because they always break down there. You always see yes. hin hinging in the back, not even not in the yeah. hip so much, it's in the back. And that's so bad for you. That's like, like a Stu McGill no-no. You see yeah, the back becoming uh, yeah. more flexible in a bad way. And I've learned this many years ago, not just with me, but with clients. Yeah. Like I would say, and they would, like any type of uh, back, if they have any type of back issues, like the uh, facet joint irritation or whatever it is, right. if they do this on the, on the leg curl, they're done. Yeah. Done. Uh, and it's really bad. Remember the other time, the only other time that I felt really big discomfort is when I was training with the powerlifters mm -hmm. once, mm -hmm. and they told me to arch my back like crazy on the bench press. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. me, I said, so I brought my heels and all, like mm -hmm. my feet by my hip, everything, mm -hmm. and I did one lift. I racked it, and I had pain for two days. Yeah, from arching. Yeah, and, and I can lift much better without arching. Yeah. Because obviously pain makes you weaker, but uh, yeah, and that's so that's for me again. That's a limitation I have. I cannot hyperextend my back; otherwise, I feel it. Yeah. But yeah, that's why you have to learn, and that's why I think the squat and the deadlift done properly with the proper progression mm -hmm. are the best exercise for a spinal solstice or any back issue. And on that note, I want to say thank you, Mr. Andre Benoit, uh, for spending your time and your wisdom and your experience the good and the bad <laughs> thank you with all of us so we can learn uh from the school of hard knocks <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. uh i really had a great time with you today and i, I learned a bit uh, a bunch and uh, i i hope this uh, interview can help those uh, with spondylolisthesis as well as coaches who have clients with spondylolisthesis hope you guys enjoyed it and if yeah. you did enjoy it let us know we'll do some more interviews uh, but until then, this is Chris Frederick with the Stretch to Win Institute at StretchToWin.com. Stay strong and stay flexible. Take care. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you.